All right. Good morning, Doug. We have some interesting topics to talk about today. I'd like to talk about this whole uh, gas stove controversy, talk about what seems to be happening with Biden, and he might be in serious trouble. There's some interesting stuff, uh, news we get as the World Economic Forum is about to start next week, and uh, maybe a cyber attack stuff with air traffic control system if we get to it. But first of all, mm -hmm. you, saw this, you saw this gas stove stuff, didn't you? <laughs> This is so stupid and so inconsequential, but potentially so damaging. Who the hell are these people that come up with these insane propositions and send them out there? What's going on? I mean, where do, the, where do these people come up with this crap? Well, I think that the big, like the, 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 the legitimate reason I think that they have that these ideas get out there, legitimate reason is because you know, they want to uh, centralize more control. And if, and by everyone being on electricity instead of these more kind of independent energy sources, uh, that's why you don't want to, on an electric car, we have to plug into the electric grid in order to get charged versus being able to carry around a fuel source with you, basically gasoline or whatever. And I think the same is for, for natural gas in your house, you know, for this. So like, if you have to do electric instead, they can turn it off at any time. They can monitor how much you use. And they can be controlled centrally. So I think that's the reason why they want to do it. But it, what's amazing to me is how they drop these things out there that are really absurd, you know, on its face. It's like, it's an absurd argument that we need to get rid of these. And it's like the decision's already done, that it needs to happen because of all these health reasons. We have this study that says it. And then in, on the same day, you the debate just goes crazy on social media. It just went nuts. I mean, where there's all a whole bunch of memes about how ridiculous it is, you know, and then there's, a, you know, people coming out defending it. It falls right into this right versus left paradigm immediately. And people just get sucked into this silly debate. It's amazing. Yeah, actually. yeah it, it, it really is. It really is silly because if, if you're going to, let's just say, cook your food, there are two ways to do it that I can think of. One is gas which is what all professional cooks use. They all use gas. No quality restaurants ever use electric, number one. Uh, or you can use uh, electric. Uh, but I've always understood that it takes so much energy to heat up an electric grill and you can't control the temperature that well. And then a lot of heat is wasted as it cools down gradually when you turn it off. And, you know, one thing that entirely apart from these technical things, well, the first thing, it's a it's a moral thing. What's what business is it of the government? What people are using to, to cook? This is, you know, what the government, if you assume you want a government should do is three things. Defend you from foreign invaders. De defend you from domestic criminals, cops, and maybe have a, a court system to adjudicate disputes. This, this is not a legitimate function of government by any stretch of the imagination. But I guess the main rationale for it is that methane is even deadlier than um, carbon, isn't it? That is, it is. And we've got to stop the, well, not just methane, uh, we have and also, we have to get rid of, you know, there's all kinds of problems we have with these gases. Yeah. Oh, I, I know. I've seen movies where uh, the uh, gas is left on, but the pilot lights off, and then the house blows up spectacularly. Yes. Seen those. Yep. I've seen it in movies, too. Yep. And, and, of course, it's possible to stick your, I guess, to stick your head in a, in a gas stove with the pilot light turned off and to uh, asphyxiate yourself. So... I mean, that's undoubtedly, uh, you know, they'll come up with something about how many deaths we have by you yeah. know, people sticking their heads in stoves every year. They'll come up with something like that. It's a health measure. Yeah. Well, it, the, well, the environment measure. Measure. And I mean, what's more important than health for both humans and the environment, really? Oh, nothing is. Nothing is. No, the, the you know, it's, it, it's amazing. The, um, in the past, when we had people that said, goofy things uh, and did goofy things uh, that were obviously psychologically Im unbalanced, we tend to not confront them and kind of, you know, forget that they were there because it's not like you want to, uh, it's unseemly to uh, attack a person who's 
suffering from a disability, a mental disability. But now there are so many of these people that are so crazy that you actually have to confront them and call a spade a spade. I guess you're not supposed to say that anymore. I don't know. It's got connotations. But uh, you can't say anything anymore. You've got to walk on eggshells everywhere. But these people are out of control. They're crazy. They're actually, they're actually insane. Many of them are criminally insane. So they, they have to be confronted. And this has got to be the next. Listen, here's an interesting thing. They want everybody to drive electric cars. And, you know, for many years, as a, as a car aficionado, not so much anymore. I don't really give a damn anymore uh, about them for reasons that I could talk about. But, um, you know, I said, yeah, I like the idea of uh, electric cars because they, it, because of where the batteries are, they have lower centers of gravity and, you know, they're, they're quiet and the, the torque comes on immediately. There's, there's all kinds of advantages to it. And you had a, a Tesla. For yep. a while, it's a good car. Yeah, but um, you know they've got disadvantages. Like in a cold environment, uh, batteries just don't work the way they should. Quite frankly, that's kind of a big problem. Uh, but uh, how about the electric grid? It's uh, it's extremely vulnerable to a terrorist attack, uh, which, which I think will, you know, be something that's going to come up in the future. Somebody's going to blow up some, some of these big substations, which are everywhere and are completely undefended, or any of the big high-tension power lines, which are just super easy to take out uh, and take a while to replace. So, but, but the, the electric grid is overloaded anyway for all kinds of reasons. So it's actually a bad idea to try to electrify everything. It makes it makes the uh, it makes everything more centralized, which I guess they like. Well, I know they like it, and more vulnerable to problems. Well, so, I think the key thing I think the key thing with all of these with the effort to control people, you know, movement and uh, behavior of people, uh, which I think is the big underlying goal with, with all of these maneuvers is that uh, electricity works well in a digital world, meaning where uh, you know you have, where the digital world essentially controls whether or not you have access to resources, access to spaces, you know, access to goods and services. And so electricity works well in that. It's much more complex to do that because it's, because it's centralized and other reasons. It's, it's easier to do with electric than it would be to do with uh, you know, propane tanks or something like that. Just be very difficult. So that's the main motivation, I think, for doing it, which we should definitely reject because that's bad. I mean, it, it will not lead to good places if it happens. No, maybe some, maybe one of these crazy people got the idea when they might have seen a uh, uh, an episode of um, it's not Family Guy. It's the one where the uh, where the Texas guy is selling propane and propane accessories. Oh yeah, I can't yeah. remember all. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anybody that lives in Texas, it's kind of a good old boy. Uh, that maybe that kind of drew their attention to that. Of course, not that they know the difference between propane and ethane or methane or any of these things, but we'll have to ask Alexandria Ocasio Cortez for a scientific opinion, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But so, so one last thing on this, I just think is very interesting is that I do believe that things like this are used as a way to uh, create a, a fervor to get people engaged in a debate about something, which we've been doing now for the last 10 minutes. Like we've been doing it, talking about it. But yeah. uh, so it works. It works. It's so tempting. We're, we're playing into their hands, aren't we? We are. We are. Exactly. Because they want, I mean, this is a trivial issue that is with it, that it, but it's part of a very non-trivial issue, which is like, what right does the government have to regulate these things? What's the, what's the global, why is the World Economic Forum endorse, the, uh, endorse this approach? Like those kinds of things are important, but instead they are, everyone just gets sucked in, gets baited in because everyone has a knee-jerk reaction to these things. Like everyone knows 
that has an opinion whether or not they're good or bad. You know what I mean? Immediately. Like if you've used one ever in your life, you're like, of course, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just fine. It's not a health hazard. It's totally fine. It's another way to bifurcate the population. And generally speaking, the ones that like the idea of getting rid of gas stoves, they're probably going to be the same people that want to wear masks and and want a, a, a trans person in in every family and the same people. Yeah. And I think that's part of it too, is they'd have these 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 topics that are just thrown out for people to to feed upon are topics that naturally fall into that bifurcated uh, lines that already exist. So they're not creating new lines. It's just that everyone falls right into where they were before. Yeah, it's kind of uh, solid solidifying the uh, differences between people. Exactly. So, it's a trick. Well, we'll, see this, we'll see how this thing, if it blows over, or it probably won't blow over, it'll... You know, after 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 it's seven days of headline news, but it'll still be there, and you know some of the powers of darkness will still try to build the case for it and tax yeah. it in order to encourage people to use less and so forth. Yeah, it's coming. I have no doubt about it. So uh, let's see. The next one is well, we can't we can't. We can't use barbecue uh, grills to cook our food because charcoal is bad. That's like pure carbon. Maybe that's going to be the next thing. And and lighter fluid that you use to fire the things up. Well, that's a hydrocarbon. Can't use that either. Can't use wood either because, because wood releases carbon when it's burned. So yeah, we're back to electricity. And when the when the grid breaks, then everybody's going to be eating cold canned food, I guess. Which I don't think they care if that's a, I don't think they see that as a problem. So they're not going to be eating cold canned food in DeVos, no. So let's talk about scapegoats. Uh, there was recently discovered uh, that Biden apparently had some confidential uh, documents he wasn't supposed to have, kind of similar to the situation that happened with Trump last year. And um, it's funny because timing of it was they found out about it right before the election, didn't announce it then, but all of a sudden it's become a big deal. And then they found now they have these lawyers going through all of his stuff and found yet another cache of these comp or these secret documents, apparently that were here stacked in boxes next to his Corvette in his garage. And um, it's, and, and they're going at, they're not at where they've cut Biden an enormous amount of slack on every issue from the failed withdrawal from Afghanistan, you know, through everything, everything, they've cut them a slack on this. They are not all of a sudden, all of a sudden the good, you know, attorney general, uh, Mary Garland comes out and decides he needs to appoint a uh, special prosecutor who happens to be a uh, former U S attorney appointed by Trump. So Republican mm -hmm. go after him. Seems like they're serious. Is, what's with the change? Do you think? Well, my first question would be, all right, so if Garland is appointing a Republican, he might be one of those, you know, pseudo turncoat rhino Republicans that the Trump administration was full of because Trump had such bad judgment on picking people. So maybe, you know, maybe that's a way to kind of solve the problem without solving the problem. But maybe, maybe they've figured that it's time to get rid of Biden and, uh, you know, show that they're equal opportunity prosecutors and get rid of them because you need to get rid of them and not replace them with Kamala. It might be even worse. Who knows what's going on in Washington? What kind of a subtle coup is being perpetrated? Yeah, I think he's done. I think he's going to be gone. I, I don't, they, they, he certainly gets in the way of, uh, you know, the next election cycle. If he's around much longer, you know, he needs to be out of the way. So another candidate can build momentum and credibility or whatever. Plus, you know, there's been a lot, like people are very unhappy with the state of things, with the economy, with inflation. And so this a scapegoat is just an incredibly useful political tool. Like someone has to be it. And I think Biden's it. Yes. And even even imbeciles that want to cut him as much slack as possible can see that he's 
non compass mentis, that he's he's mentally what is it? Alzheimer? Some, something's wrong with the way the guy's mind works. He's just he's just senile. He's just old and tired. He has no business being uh, with his finger on the red button, as it were. Oh, I think it's elder abuse, honestly, to have him in there. You know, honestly, to make him put him out there like that, it's just terrible. It really is. Not to say he's not. And, and, they, like can, and they can no longer disguise the uh, the corruption. I mean, the it's like. It, it, it's it, it's like their obscene war uh, in the Ukraine is being compromised by the fact that, you know, Joe and Hunter were collecting all this money from the Ukraine. Right. So I think they held all this stuff back until a point where they're like, OK, and the midterms are over. Now let's go ahead and do it. And all of a sudden it comes out, you know, it's a huge in the news cycle. And then really quick, a special prosecutor is appointed. I think he'll end up resigning and I think it'll be fairly quick. Honestly, that, that'd be my guess at this point. I mean, they'll, they'll want to like make sure that everyone agrees he needs to go. But the way, again, I feel like this has been set up is that it's really easy because with this exact same accusation that was against Trump, the exa exactly the same accusation. Exactly. And then yeah. Democrats, you know, like the Republicans said, it's not a big deal. Like it's, this happens all the time and he can, he can, you know, um, you know, uh, make it, uh, uh, you know, not confidential anytime he wants as president. So, so it wasn't, they, so they presented it as it wasn't a big deal, but for the Democrats, they, for the last months, they've been calling for him to be imprisoned for it. I mean, they've been going after him so hard for it. Then all of a sudden when it reverses, it's going to be very difficult. It's too soon for them to be able to defend him if they really wanted to. Yeah. But on the other hand, the Republicans, not, not that I have any respect or make a case for the Republicans. I mean, they're, they're their own worst enemy, and in some ways, they're worse than the Democrats, quite frankly. But uh, they only have a very narrow majority in the House, and many of those Republicans are actually Democrats in disguise. So are they really going to be able to make a, a serious change at all? No, uh, I don't think no, so. I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think he'll be impeached. I think they'll talk in the you're right. Yeah, he'll, he'll resign. Yeah. Yeah. That's better. And then, and then Kamala. Well, then what happens with Kamala? I don't know. I, I, I think she's going to be the one. I mean, unbelievably, like this is must be some giant humiliation ritual for us as Americans. <laughs> that's that's that that's that's right. It's like electing the ugliest girl and the most stupid guy as presidents and whatever of the senior prom or something like that. It, yeah. it's, a, it's just embarrassing, but they can't. So what happens after Kamala? I mean, wouldn't the average American say this is just really just too much? I mean, this, this woman is. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, because the Democrats do not have that same negative view that everyone on, you know, every Republican has. Like, I think that they actually, and also I, I think that people are so factional that they'll defend her, especially if people attack her, like they will defend her. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that she's their girl, whether well, a woman. So yeah. I don't know. I think she's, she is the obvious, I mean, if he's going to resign, she's the one, there's just no way around it. But I, I can't remember for some reason how, the, how you get a new vice president. What's that process for the selection of a new vice president? Well, it happened when Nixon resigned and Ford just automatically stepped into his place. And uh, then who became Ford's vice president? Uh, hmm, I forget. Is that's what's, and I should, I have to look into that, how that's done, because there must be some prescribed process for how that, or the, certainly there's a precedent for it now, at least. So, because I think the big question is who will be the VP? Yes, and of course, the only part of the constitution that is, that is uh, followed and observed fairly rigorously are things like succession and election of the Speaker of the House and things things like that. Um, procedures. Uh, procedural Proced stuff, right. The important stuff in the Constitution that's supposed to protect the uh, average American from his government, that's it's all a dead letter. So they'll figure, but they, they can't run Kamala in, uh, in 24 for president that I don't, of course they'll steal the election. I'm absolutely convinced of that. 
since they have control of the apparatus of the state, they'll figure out some way. They can elect anybody. They can elect a ham sandwich. But uh, hmm. it looks like was Rockefeller. Is that who became the VP? Oh, was it? Yes. Was it Nelson Rockefeller? Was he still alive? Yeah. Was. Oh. Is that who was? Rockefeller was when Vice President of the United States under President Ford, who ascended to the presidency after the resignation of Nixon. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know much about Rockefeller, except that he was a, uh, a horrible rhino. And I think probably the most interesting thing about his life was that it was determined that uh, he died uh, in, in the act of coitus with... Uh, a young lady who was about uh, 40 or 50 years his junior. And uh, that was kind of covered up and quashed, but that's what actually happened. So that's funny. That's funny. So it sounds like they're just selected, like they just picked by the president. Yeah, because Nelson Rockefeller wasn't a member of the, he was. He ran for president in a prior year. Looked right, right. That's what it was. So, hmm. oh, anything can happen. It's like selecting a Roman Empire. And anyway, the Praetorian Guard is going to have a say in this, the CIA and the uh, FBI and the NSA and the rest of them. Could be, could be Hillary. <laughs> Any, anything is possible. This, this is the best shot she has to be president, actually, is right now with this, with, if Biden resigns. She gets in the VP yeah, slot, happens to Kamala. <laughs> This is like a this is like a, a, a giant live soap opera, and the writers can plug anybody in that they want in the soap opera. So that's yeah, it's quite possible. Interesting. Okay. I also think in the spirit of the whole scapegoat thing, I do think that there's gonna be some other some other people that get the rope, at least metaphorically here. And I think uh, like the you know, articles of impeachment have been filed against that uh, DHS secretary, Mayorkas. Because you know, there's been like five million uh, illegal immigrants who have entered the U.S. Uh, under his tenure, so mm -hmm. I, you know the articles of impeachment are filed against him, and I mean that's certainly something the House could probably actually do is get him to resign, take you know take fall on his sword for that, and who knows maybe even Fauci and Walensky you know get a little bit of a public haranguing for their uh, their part in uh, poisoning the population. Well. Yes, and there's got to be something they can hang Mayor Pete out to dry on for being a total incompetent. As well I, think as I, think I think he's a good VP prospect, actually. I'd put him in the top five the of who they'd pick. You know, you're right, Matt. I shouldn't even comment about these things because I'm convinced I'm, I'm living in a bubble. I don't have my finger on the pulse of the average American at this point, whoever the average American might be, because the average American that lives in LA or New York is not the average American that lives in flyover country. So whose pulse do I want to take? I think the big problem, Doug, is that you, th you, you're using a different standard to judge whether or not they're qualified because uh, under the standard that you're thinking, Mayor Pete obviously would be totally and utterly unqualified for any office that it currently holds or has ever held or might hold in the future. But, you know, in the new standards, he's completely qualified. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a McKinsey, former McKinsey consultant, uh, you know, gay um, man. So he's basically exactly, you know, he's a, some repressed minority group and he's definitely, he, he meets all the qualifications of, of this, uh, this woke regime. Yeah. Well, I, I'd rather <clears throat> not solve the mayor Pete problem, <clears throat> which is a trivial problem uh, by impeaching him or firing him. I'd rather solve it by abolishing the Department of Transportation, which serves no useful purpose whatsoever. Yeah, I agree. Well, speaking of that, why don't we jump to one of the most recent Department of Transportation's failures, and that is this the air traffic control system that went down. Uh, basically, it was a uh, they, they, the FAA ordered a ground halt across the U.S. because of a failure of one of the air traffic control systems. And Every plane, it was like 9-11, first time since 9-11 they've done this, they ground every plane. And this isn't the first time, the only time this has happened recently. And I, I noticed before this, and 
uh, I think it was on January 1st in the Philippines, they had something go wrong and they had, you know, where uh, air traffic was shut down for a period of time, for a day at least. Then that we had a little one where we had the same thing in Florida, but it was isolated just to Florida for a day. And then you have a much bigger one, this across the U.S., and I wonder if this is if this if they're testing out cyber attack stuff. I mean, it's hmm. a good target, wouldn't it? Yeah, it makes sense. Of course, I've wondered when it comes to the um, air traffic control uh, system. For they were decades behind on their um, computer equipment, uh, not even having flat screens. I, I don't know to what degree. They've spent the immense amount of money that would have had to have been spent to upgrade it from 1950s junk computers to state of the art. I don't know if they, to what degree they've done that to start with. The little bit of reading I did this morning is that there was a huge upgrade that took a long time and was completed something like six years ago, at least on parts of the system, if not the whole system. Hmm. It was an effort to do that. So you'd think that um, that upgrade would have made the uh, system harder to hack. I think it'd make it easier. It's probably more connected. Mm. Probably more centralized. You know what I mean? Like if it's, because you got to imagine this, this uh, strung together 1950s technology is probably anti-fragile in many ways. You know, not very efficient, but. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we, we, we just, I guess we don't know. But what I am pretty confident of is that um, World War III, or whatever looks like it, uh, is going to be very, very different from World War II. And since computers rule the world today in every, absolutely every area of life, that uh, if I was a bad guy looking to take out the US, that would be one of the prongs of my uh, multidimensional attack. Definitely computers, just gigantic. The banking system, people can't get money. You know, the utilities would go down, the airlines go down, the telephones go down, the satellites go down. I mean, you know, if we lost computers, we would, uh, I don't know what would happen. I don't know either, but it could be very, it, I mean, it certainly is probably a lot easier to do than have to, uh, you know, bomb populations, you know, land tanks or whatever to take over territory. It seems uh, like it's the only easy way to get things done. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I guess the, the, the Russians and the, the Ukrainians aren't engaging, apparently, in massive cyber warfare between themselves is because they're both third world countries, really, and don't have the kind of reliance on them that we do, I would think. Yeah, I think the more advanced the country is, the more more at risk they are to all these things. You know, there's one thing that else that happened with this FAA incident that I think is worth noting, and I have not seen this advertised or, you know, uh, no articles written about it. But at the time where there was that ground halt, all the aircraft out of the sky, at that time, there were 52 air-to-air -air refueling tankers in the air. And, and I assume they're to support many fighter jets that were scrambled. So I like I, I found that uh, that's a sh pretty shocking detail. I think that either they saw it as a threat or or it was an exercise. You know, they so it's hard to believe it was just a a database error is what they're suggesting it was. Like there was a mm -hmm. mess up. Database, so, well, we don't have certain information about any of these things because it's if it's important, it's classified. So the yeah. only information we really have is kind of anecdotal in nature. Yeah, that's true. Good point. All right. Well, last, let's end up with this uh, World Economic Forum. You know that this year's Davos effort is in is starting next week, and I'm sure you didn't get an invitation this year, I guess. Well, I, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, I passed uh, when Der Schwab and Klaus invited me to lunch. Uh, uh, he, he, he insisted on... on so I said, look, uh, I'll pass. Maybe next year we'll look at it. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're not going because, you know, it's obviously it puts you on a blacklist among uh, one side. That's for sure right away. <laughs> right. 
these there's some interesting things that happen there that they get published around this. And um, you know, Switzerland is a very different country. There's a lot of very different things that go on about it. But there's two specific notes I thought were particularly interesting. And one was, you know, that uh, the prostitution that happens there is pretty significant. Apparently, it's a lot of money be made during that week. I don't know if you saw any details of that, but yeah, I I, I did, and uh, it, it is interesting. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Switzerland over the years, and uh, Talk with Mark Faber about this. Mark, Mark is kind of a connoisseur of this type of thing. So we talk about that. And in, in Switzerland, which is um, very international and very upmarket, uh, there are certain houses of ill repute in all the major Swiss cities. Um, and it's funny when you walk in just to see what's going on. Uh, over the years, the girls that populate these places are from different countries. And the countries that they're from are generally the countries that are having the worst economic problems. Like, I remember one time I was surprised to see that all the girls in this one place were all from Austria. Hmm. I mean, this was the year when, for one, for one reason or another, Austrian girls that wanted to move from, you know, backwater little cow town in Austria to the big city, but had no marketable skills, but were cute, you know, would go to the Niederdorfstrasse and find employment, you know, start yeah. hauling in the big box. And uh, of course, now it's all Russian and Ukrainian girls. Well, strike that, Ukrainian girls today. So um, it's the same thing with the French Foreign Legion. It's like uh, everybody that was in the in the Legion after World War II were all ex ex Wehrmacht guys, you know, and then then it then it circled to you know Eastern Europeans and so forth. So it's it's like that with these organizations, the two oldest occupations, being of course uh, fighting and um, <laughs> I, I won't use the uh, impolite F word for that, but those are the two most primeval and oldest occupations for males and females, respectively. So um, anyway, Davos. So here we are in Switzerland. So where are you going to get the local talent, especially when uh, the police and the army are, are, are saying, you're a pup here and bitter to everybody that wants to step into town. So I guess you have to pre-clear girls to um, fulfill a certain function. And... Uh, I guess they're mostly Ukrainians. I would imagine they are at this point. There's a, there's a, I don't, I, I can't share it on my screen right now, but there's a two different things I thought specific posts I saw that were very interesting. And one was an, an advertisement uh, from the World Economic yeah. Forum explicitly for young blonde girls between 18, I said not young girls, young women between 18 and 26 years old to work for 150 uh, euros a day for the World Economic Forum. So uh, mm. not very diverse of them. I don't know if their their DEI specialists are on the case or if their HR department has the day off or something. This seems not right to me. No, it, it, it doesn't. And, and those are kind of beginners. I mean, they're not like tired old whores that they're rounding up from the streets of Paris or something like that. <clears throat> you know, this reminds me, I, I feel like uh, we need some levity in our yeah. conversations. Yeah. So let me... So that age range that you've mentioned, that's very interesting because um, uh, one friend of mine uh, was, uh, I won't mention his last name, but he's an extremely famous gambler, sports better, okay? Uh, Ivan, and they call him the doctor. Uh, that's what he's known at in the sports betting world. So I've spent a lot of time with Ivan. We were talking about his days in Las Vegas and he knew all those guys in that movie, uh, Casino, and all that, all, of, all these guys personally. So he's telling me about this one friend of his, Maury. And um, so Ivan says, says, I went up to Maury and I said, hey, listen, I've got, I've got the girl for you. She's, uh, she has her own money. She's good looking. She's smart. She knows who you are. He's about 40 years, you know, he's about 60 or something like that. 
and she wants to meet you. And so Maury has a question. Uh, how old is she? Ivan says, it's perfect. She's 27. And uh, uh, Maury says, no, forget about it. I never date girls over, over 23. And, and, and Ivan says, Maury, what the hell's the matter with you? You're an old guy. And, and he says, well, if they're, if they're under 25, 20, 23 or 25, you know, all they want to do is have fun. They don't think about the future. They don't plan ahead. They're, they're just up for a good time. And, and, and that was his answer. So that, that's probably the way the Davos guys think. They think the way Maury did in Las Vegas. So those girls, I think, yeah, and then he's got, and then they also, uh, the, the other thing I have is this, uh, a Swiss escort agency revealing the price for sex at the Davos for their CEOs and, you know, and guests. And, um, you know, they have, uh, for four hours, it's 1500 Swiss francs. I don't really know what the conversion on that is. And for one night, it's, it's 20. It's Swiss francs about, I don't know, 105 or 106 at the moment. Okay, so fifteen hundred. Uh, I guess it's not as expensive as I would expect for for the for the Davos crowd. Honestly, I don't know. I these are all Ukrainian girls that are penniless, and I, somebody's somebody's you know probably raking off fifty percent or three quarters, and they're working for tips on top of the standard wage. Is probably the way it works. Um, sure. uh, yeah, but, uh, um, I just these people. I find it funny I mean, that these this is, this is this is this is what we call white slavery. <laughs> it would be nice if this was widely promoted. I mean, I've got no problem with with these guys amus amusing themselves. Maybe they ought to bring in a, a coterie of um, a coterie of, uh, of of butter boys to suit the uh, needs of people like Nubal Hovel Harari. Uh, sure, they'll uh, be there. You know, I mean. You know, taste for everybody, but uh, but it's the same. It's it's the it's the high and mighty. You know, we're the good guys. You guys are the dumb plebs. You know, the, the dirty, unwashed masses can't be trusted to make good and ethical decisions for yourself. It's just that that just rubs you the wrong way with it when you see it's so obviously they're just scoundrels. These people. I I, I just hate hypocrites. I mean, I I, I wouldn't. Look, I don't care what they do, what the girls do or the guy. I don't, I don't give a damn. I think it's, it, but the fact that they're so sanctimonious and hypocritical about this is what really makes me sick. I mean, and, and you know, I, I think you mentioned there's like 5,000 imported army Five, and police. Swiss, 5,000, the Swiss army was uh, deployed to That's protect- like more than that's like more than the regular population of Davos. I, we can look it up and see what the year-round population is, but uh, it always swells during the winter. It's a ski resort, but uh, I mean, this place is just... It says 10, it's 11,000. It's 11,000. God, between, between foreign bureaucrats and imported prostitutes and heavily armed army guys running around I wouldn't want to be in in, in Davos. I, I can imagine that, you know, what what uh, Ian Fleming would have done with this, uh, you know, how how he would have handled. Somebody at some point is going to wind up setting off a, a backpack nuke nuke in uh, Davos. Yeah, something because these it's and I I don't know how many what the security was like last year, but. I, w I would expect this is a big uh, increase in, in the, the protection they have versus last year. I mean, apparently they're doing like fingerprint scans of people even entering the area. So everyone is positively biometrically identified. Well, you know, it wasn't, uh, how long ago was it? I think it was 10 years ago, uh, Jeff Berwick uh, went to DeVos and actually was able to get a hotel room and, you know, try to make a, you know, uh, investigate and make a nuisance of himself. So it was possible for a pleb even 10 years ago to go there. Not possible anymore, obviously. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. Yeah. Now, these people are out of control. They are. But but at the same time, you know, I really don't want someone like if, it's almost like they it's like they want you to do something stupid. They want someone to show up there, you know, and uh, and and cause some trouble so that then they can. I don't know, roll out their digital ID or something, you know, if there's some, I don't know. 
I don't like, you know, all the, anything that happens, any, any uh, like act against these people that are engaging in all this evil stuff on people will just be used against the plebs anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The plebs, the hoi polloi, or also you can call them the capita kensi, which in Latin, the Romans used to call them that also, not just plebeians, the head count. Head count. <laughs> That's us. That's us. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's it for the topics I wanted to cover today, Doug. Unless there's something else you wanted to add, we can uh, we can end for the weekend and wish everyone a happy weekend. Well, let's just hope the bad guys put away their tools for the weekend and nothing uh, terrible happens until we uh, talk again next week. I have to say, it does seem like they like their weekends and holidays. That's the impression I get. It does seem like it. Well, and absolutely, absolutely, especially with, with party time going on in Davos now. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think we'll be all clear for at least a week. Yeah. Good, Doug. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks. Thanks, Matt.